Hello and welcome to York Observatory's Teletube, the online astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. I'm Guggen and I'll be one of your hosts this evening, and I'm joined by Quentin, Matt, and Amin, broadcasting live from the Allen I. Carswell Observatory and with Anna and June behind the telescope. We are located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Tonight, we've got a great presentation about spectroscopy. Teletube broadcasts every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. local Toronto time. For any questions or comments you have of our past shows, or if you have suggestions for future topics, please send us an email at observe at yorku.ca. You can also connect with us on Facebook with the handle Alan I. Carswell Ops, or on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at York Observatory. Before we get started with the main show, we wanted to give you a little update on what you can see in the sky this coming week. The moon is currently rising in the east in the waning gibbous phase after the full moon we had earlier this week and will be visible throughout the night, setting around 10 a.m. tomorrow. The moon will reach its half moon phase on Tuesday, the night before our next show. We also have the Pleiades in the east, which will be visible almost all night and set in the early morning. The Pleiades are an open star cluster containing thousands of stars and appear as a small collection of, five, of six to seven stars in most night skies. But if you're lucky enough to have exceptionally dark skies this week or a telescope, you'll be able to see a lot more. The constellations Taurus and Orion will be rising following the Pleiades in the east, so keep an eye out for the bright red bullseye Aldebaran and Orion's belt. The Andromeda galaxy is high in the sky this evening and will be setting a few hours after midnight but you'll most likely need a telescope or binoculars with very dark skies to see it. We've also got a few planets with great views. Mars is high in the southeast right now, and Saturn and Jupiter are just about to disappear below the southwestern horizon, but they'll be visible in the early evenings. You'll be able to see the Pleiades, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, as well as other stars and the moon with your naked eye. But if you'd like to see a little more detail on the moon and other objects, a pair of binoculars or a small telescope are great aids. And now, Dr. Hyde and Anna and June will be showing you some live images from our one meter telescope. Thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction. We will in fact be bringing over the, uh, the live views from the one meter telescope here. Right over, um, let's see here. Now, as we're looking at the Pleiades stars, you can see a bit of blue light coming through. Um, now let's just go ahead and hand off to our crew. Um, who's got some fun Pleiades facts that they'd like to share? I, I do. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so one thing that I found uh, quite interesting was uh, the Pleiades, as, uh, as, as you just mentioned, is um, a star cluster. All of those stars are located uh, comparatively close to each other in physical space. And uh, an interesting thing that I learned is that uh, when you see a group of stars that, are that appear to be located near each other, it can be hard to tell at first whether they're actually all in the same stellar neighborhood or whether they just appear to be nearby each other because they have similar angles, but they're actually uh, very far apart. However, we have actually known that the Pleiades are a physically related group of stars since the 1700s. Uh, in 1767, uh, John Mitchell calculated that the probability of a chance alignment of so many bright stars was only one in 500,000. And so concluded that the most likely, um, the most likely conclusion was that they were in fact a cluster of stars that were all located near each other in physical space. Uh, and he was able to, and he, uh, he and other astronomers were able to do this with other uh, well-known bright star clusters as well. So I, I, I think that that's just an interesting, an interesting fact that they were able to just use statistics to determine that there is a very good chance that the star clusters that they saw were in fact genuine uh, star clusters and not just uh, groups of stars with similar angles. Indeed. Anyone else got a fun, uh, fun Pleiades fact? I have a quick yeah. fact. Go for it. Oh, I'm in. <laughs> Uh, uh, the Pleiades is actually the nearest Messier object to Earth. Uh, the mess, and a Messier object is a 
classification of uh, celestial objects. Uh, usually it starts with M and then there's a number beside it. Uh, the Pleiades is M45. Uh, and yes, is the closest one of those objects. Wonderful. And uh, um, I think uh, we had one more fun fact, and then we will think about visiting a couple other stars while we're doing our live imaging tonight. Or maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, I think we had one, one possible extra fun fact about the Pleiades, of course. Um, Gagin, you had one that was quite good. Yeah, so the Pleiades, um, because they're a really recognizable and easily seen star cluster from Earth with the naked eye, ancient civilizations actually used this cluster as um, a vision test. So normally you can see about four to six stars on a good night um, with current light pollution. But back then, the number of stars you could see was a measure of how sharp your vision was. So the more stars you could see, the better you could see. That is a wonderful fact. So, you know, if you are looking up in dark enough skies, um, you can, uh, of course, use this to test your vision as well. Now, um, in addition to, uh, you know, the Pleiades being um, a good eye test, they are very, very bright and blue. Um, that blue color is coming through a little bit on our mail and cam image. And um, that's because they're, of course, those very, very young stars forming in that nebula with the gas around them. So there's a little bit of contrast. We're actually having our telescope operators go over to Aldebaran. And I'm just shifting it across so that you can see um, we're currently going to move the telescope from the Pleiades over to Aldebaran. And we'll go ahead and see if we can't show you a little bit of a different kind of star. And um, we'll see about maybe getting a different color. If we're very lucky, we'll be able to detect a different, uh, different color. Um, uh, okay, and we'll go ahead and move the telescope over. Uh, as you can see, we've got our navigation screen here loaded for you on the, uh, this is the one meter telescope at the Allen I Carswell Observatory, um, being remotely controlled by Anna and June. And we'll go from the Pleiades over to Aldebaran. So this is why I always like to say that, you know, telescopes make the best spaceships because where else could you travel that amazing distance uh, this fast? Um, uh, so off we go to Aldebaran and then we'll be able to refresh our, our camera image and try to pull up Aldebaran for you. Oh yes, okay, here we go. It is coming through very, very well here. Fabulous, uh, fabulously bright, maybe just a smidge overexposed. Um, we'll see about reducing our um, exposure time here. In the meantime, uh, Quentin, uh, go ahead with your Aldebaran fact. Okay. Uh, the name for Aldebaran, like the names for many of the stars that we know today, uh, comes from Arabic. It comes from uh, the word Aldebaran, which means uh, the follower, specifically the one that follows Pleiades. Uh, what I found interesting about this, this piece of nomenclature was even though it has been, that star has been referred to that name traditionally for uh, centuries, the, um, the working group on star names, the w WGSN, only officially approved the name in 2016. So despite the fact that this has been the colloquial name for the star for a long time, it did kind of surprise me to learn that uh, it wasn't that name wasn't made official uh, for uh, for the star until only a couple of years ago. That is surprising. Um, Aldebaran is a wonderful follow up, of course. Um, it's red color uh, coming through very, very, very nicely. And of course, that red color indicating that it is an older star um, and, you know, will have a longer lifetime than those bright blue stars you saw in the Pleiades. So you kind of get the two extremes by going from the Pleiades to Aldebaran. So if Aldebaran really is the follower, he's, um, he's a old, uh, <laughs> an old creaky follower chasing along after those those young uh, um, whippersnappers, the Pleiades. Um, so let's see here. 
has anyone else got a fun Aldebaran fact they'd like to uh, volunteer tonight? A super quick one. Um, Aldebaran is about 44 times the size of the sun. This a uh, quick little fact there. That is a very good fact. It is worth mentioning the, these uh, things out in space are occasionally incredibly, incredibly large. It's uh, the vast distances um, are, are truly, truly immense. All right, so speaking of fancy red objects, if nobody has another fun Aldebaran fact, we might go from looking at stars to looking at planets. All right, looks pretty good. Um, let's go ahead and get set up here with our technicians to go to the planet Mars. And of course, you might have heard Mars is also very red, and it is, um, but for very, very different reasons than Aldebaran is red. Um, and Mars being, of course, a much, much closer by planet and not a star. So we'll just go across here and I'll show you the navigation area. Um, Mars is just across the sky a bit. You again might be able to see it if you have dark enough skies and it will look like a bright red star, um, not twinkling uh, terribly much. Um, and, uh, you know, um, shining up in the sky. Uh, it was still fairly bright after its uh, recent close approach. And it looks like our trusty telescope technicians have managed to travel to Mars. All right, wonderful. We're getting our first images in. Just a little bit hazy. We'll see what we can do to improve that for you. Uh, in the meantime, let's have some fun Mars facts. Uh, let's see, we had a bunch of different um, fun, uh, fun Mars facts. Um, now, I think, uh, Amin, uh, oh, um, you had one? I do have one. Excellent, uh, go ahead. There is actually enough water ice detected on Mars uh, to cover the whole surface to a depth of 35 meters. And there's probably actually even more than that underground, which we haven't discovered yet. That is um, that is a wonderful um, a wonderful little fun fact. Uh, let's see here. We have a uh, one more um, fun fact about Mars. Uh, joining in for a uh, a quick little cameo, one of our one of our observatory crew, Arfa Ali. You want to come in on in and uh, say a fun fact about Mars? Sure. Thank you. Um, so here's a quick fun fact. Uh, it's about the sun signs on Mars. There are uh, the sky is pinkish red. That's the opposite of the Earth skies when the sun is sitting on Mars. Wonderful. All right. Now, Mars, of course, has lots and lots of fun properties to it. Um, of, and of, let's just see if we can bring some of those out here. You might be getting just a hint of uh, colors coming through. Um, that would be from the different albedo regions on Mars, which are caused by the different colors of, of rock and dust on its surface. Um, and we'll, we'll go ahead and see if we can zoom into those really quickly. Um, in the meantime, does anyone have a, a favorite area of Mars that they really like? This is always a good question. Oh, yeah. I was hoping you were going to ask about this because I was actually dying to talk about this. Uh, my favorite region on Mars is uh, an area called uh, Sidonia. It's an albedo feature on Mars that is famous for during initial imaging uh, runs looking to the human eye like a face. Uh, you, may, you may have heard of the, uh, the so-called face on Mars. Uh, now, perhaps disappointingly, uh, ever since that image was taken, we've been able to take uh, higher resolution images and it is uh, just, just a rocky feature on the planet. It, 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 there's, nothing, there's nothing about it that would suggest that it is actually um, built by some sort of... Uh, some sort of creature that wanted to imitate the appearance of a face. Um, what was happening was due to the shading on the, on the surface, it, it ended up looking a lot more face-like than it truly is. 
Um, but it, I think that it says a lot about uh, the human mind, actually, because there is a, a, a well-documented psychological effect called pareidolia, which is the tendency for the human brain to uh, essentially um, overfit the data that it is given in order to search for um, features that we are supposed to be very good at detecting. So one example is we are able to see what appear to be faces in electrical outlets or in the um, headlights of cars. We are also very good at hearing uh, words in uh, essentially random noise, which isn't supposed to have any sort of pattern to it whatsoever. So the so-called Sidonia, the so-called face on Mars, doesn't tell us a whole lot about extraterrestrial life, but it does tell us quite a bit about the human intelligence, which I think is kind of interesting. Indeed. And Mars, of course, being um, one of the, uh, uh, you know, famous, uh, uh, you know, instigators of all kinds of science fiction and imaginary, uh, um, you know, worlds and, of course, imaginary aliens. Um, it is quite, uh, quite fun to um, to note that it's, uh, uh, you know, if, if humans ever do settle on Mars, we will become the Martians. <laughs> And Mars itself is a fabulous planet to watch because it is, um, especially right now, close enough to where we can make out some uh, good detail um, on the surface. And you might see that it's it's a little bit, um, you know, we're not getting quite the full uh, the full view. There's just a bit of haze out there. Um, and if we could stack all of these in um, at uh, you know, great, uh, you know, with lots and lots and lots of images, we could probably pull out a little bit more detail um, and see some of those in detail features, like, for example, the Valles Marineris, the biggest canyon in the solar system, um, and, of course, the mountains of Mars, the largest mountains in the solar system, on one of the smallest little planets. Uh, so it's, it's quite uh, quite nice to, to watch. And if you were to watch this all night, which you just about could until it sets, you would see that over time the, the face of Mars does change with respect to to us because of course Mars is also rotating, um, which is good fun. All right, so any last fun um, Mars facts that we want to, uh, to cover? Uh, obviously Mars being my favorite planet, I could talk about it all night. Uh, one feature I like is the South Polar Ice Cap. If you look at it uh, closely, you can see ridges and spirals. So it's really beautiful. and uh, it's mostly made of carbon dioxide ice, but it has a little bit of water ice as well. So that's interesting. That is indeed. And of course, the, uh, the polar caps of Mars, um, they had recently found just this year, uh, they documented several lakes of liquid underneath one of the polar caps. Um, almost certainly water and uh it is uh quite interesting so it's it's you know the more we find out about mars the uh the more interesting and intriguing it is but of course mars as i said it is actually quite close by earth and there are much more distant uh much more uh, um, mysterious objects out there. So since we went to some red and blue stars, we're going to go to some red and blue planets. Next up, we're going to try Neptune. Uh, and I believe we're just getting the um, uh, uh, crew ready to go to Neptune. And Neptune is um, a quite a bit more distant, quite a bit colder, and quite a bit bluer as well. So let's see here as we go across, I'll get the telescope moving. And here is our trusty old control screen, of course. And this is what our telescope technicians are using to go ahead and find Neptune and navigate from Mars all the way over to Neptune. Um, this would take you know, quite a while, even if you were a, a a spacecraft, <laughs> um, unless you had, you know, your warp engines. <laughs> um, this takes a very, very long time because Neptune is, of course, very, very distant uh, from 
from the sun and very, very, very cold. Uh, Quentin, I believe you've got some uh, Neptune facts. Uh, yes. Uh, one, one interesting thing about Neptune is Neptune's largest moon is, of course, uh, Triton, uh, which I believe is sometimes actually visible uh, through the telescope. I, 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 if I recall correctly, I've been able to see it before. I don't know if it's visible tonight. Uh, but I do know that Triton is uh, kind of remarkable in that it has a retrograde orbit around its host planet, which means that it orbits in the opposite direction uh, as, as compared to, uh, to most of the other moons in the system. It's also a very similar composition and size to the dwarf planet Pluto, which has led astronomers to believe that Triton is actually a captured dwarf planet from the Kuiper Belt. Uh, at some point in the past, uh, that that object would have fallen inward in the solar system and become trapped in Neptune's orbit. And the reason why we believe this is because uh, there is currently no mechanism that we know of for uh, retrograde moons to occur naturally. So uh, for that reason, and for the fact that it is, sim it is very similar in many ways to Pluto, we believe that it had a similar origin story to Pluto and that it originated in the Kuiper Belt and became trapped. That is a wonderful fact. Um, and of course, Neptune being a very mysterious object, um, it has not been widely explored. So unlike Mars, where we have had many, many, many robotic missions, um, Neptune has really only had a flyby and a half or so. Um, and it, there are so many things we don't know about this uh, mysterious icy outer blue planet. Let's see here. Now, I think we had one or two extra um, Neptune facts. Uh, sure Matt? Very, oh, yeah, go ahead, Amin. I can share a very quick one. Yep. Uh, Neptune is the only planet in the solar system that you can't see by the naked eye. I, would, I wouldn't have guessed you could see uh, Uranus, though. Apparently you can. Really? Oh, wow. That's that would I think be very, very good eyesight. That's cool. Um, but yes, Neptune. You'll note that we have uh, we have zoomed in on the view screen of the uh, the one meter telescope, sort of giving ourselves an artificially um, good view of the planet Neptune, and you can see it's it sort of bounces around a little bit in the image. That's of course due to the seeing in our atmosphere, the air moving around, distorting the light from the planet, but we can still get that lovely uh, lovely blue color coming through quite strongly. Uh, very, very nice. And it is obviously, the, you know, um, with the motion of Pluto, the farthest planet from the sun. So it really doesn't get much, much colder <laughs> um, planet wise. And um, it's, it's, uh, you know, lovely blue color has it named after the Roman god of the sea. And it is, it is thought to contain a lot of water, but not water as we know it. At the temperatures around Neptune, um, most of the water out there is very, very, very solid. Um, so this is great. Uh, now uh, we are a little conscious of time. Of course, we have um, all kinds of wonderful things that we could go look at all night. Um, but we also wanted to show you some red and blue because, of course, the next step other than distinguishing color would be to try to find a little bit more out about the light here. Uh, so, Gagan, I'm going to hand it back to you and you can just sort of tell us how we might use the light from these or other objects. Yeah, certainly. Um, so, we use the light from these objects in a lot of different ways. And a lot of our presentation today revolves around spectroscopy and how astronomers use light to their advantage. So we can switch it over there um, in just a second. Excellent. I'll let you grab the, uh, the screen back and we'll go ahead and hop back into your, um, uh, you know, as I say, the discussion of light. Um, and of course, always looking forward to bringing uh, more live views from the telescope whenever we can. And when, of course, whenever it's, uh, whenever it's clear, um, looking very, very good. So go ahead and take it away, crew. Perfect. Thank you. So um, without further ado, 
Matt will be starting us off with a quick introduction on the physics of light. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, well, as it was mentioned before, we would like to talk about a spectroscopy and how it relates to astronomy, what it is, its practical applications, and other interesting characteristics about it. But before that, we should start on the basics first. In other words, with light. Light is such a common word that we can even use it every day without actually knowing its real definition. We associate light to only what's visible for us, like a light bulb or even the stars. But light is much more than that. In physics, the term light refers to electromagnetic radiation of any wavelength, whether visible or not. In this sense, gamma rays, X-rays, microwaves, and radio waves are also light. But in general, when we talk about light, we mean visible light which is the same electromagnetic radiation, but only the portion that the human eye can perceive, which is a radiation with a wavelength of 400 to 700 nanometers. In order, in order to define what light is, we would need to consider a few more things though. So back in the 1800s, physicists started theorizing that light was indeed a wave, but it wasn't until 1864 when James Maxwell predicted the, ex the existence of electromagnetic waves. And out of his prediction came the concept of light being a wave, or more specifically, a type of electromagnetic wave. Until that time, the magnetic field produced by magnets and electric currents and the electric field generated between two parallel metal plates connected to a charge capacitor were con considered to be unrelated to one another. Maxwell, Maxwell changed this thinking in 1861 when he presented Maxwell's equations, which are four equations for electromagnetic theory that shows magnetic fields and electric fields are actually linked. The first equation formulates Faraday's uh, law of electromagnetic induction, which states that changing magnetic fields generate electrical fields, producing electrical current. The second equation is called Ampere-Maxwell law. It adds to Ampere's law, which states that electric current flowing over a wire produces a magnetic field around itself. And another law that says that a changing magnetic field also gives rise to a property similar to an electric current or a displacement current, and this too creates a magnetic field around itself. The third equation is the law stating that there is a general electric charge at the source of an electric field. The fourth equation is Gauss, uh, Gauss's law of magnetic field, which states that a magnetic field has no source or magnetic monopole equivalent to that of an electric charge. This led to the introduction of the concept of electromagnetic waves other than visible light into light research, which had previously focused only on visible light. Taking into account this discovery, we derived the electromagnetic spectrum, which is the range of frequencies of electromagnetic radiation and their respective wavelengths and photon energies, which I'll define later. This spectrum divides gamma rays, X-rays, uh, ultraviolet light, uh, visible light, infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. Thank you. Uh, but so far, we have seen light as a wave, and that is correct, but not the full explanation of it, because light can also act as a particle. Around the 1700s, Newton concluded that light was a group of particles, and this was known as the corpuscular theory. Uh, light travels in a straight line, and therefore it was only natural for Newton to think of it as an extremely, as extremely small particles that are emitted by a light source and reflected by objects. This theory of light being a particle completely vanished until the end of the 19th century when Albert Einstein revived it. Einstein believed that light is a particle called photon, and the flow of photons is a wave. The main point of Einstein's light quantum theory is that light's energy is related to its oscillation frequency. He maintained that photons have equal uh, to Planck's constant times uh, oscillation frequency. And this photon energy is the height of the oscillation frequency while the intensity of light is the quantity of photons. Photons are, are particles with zero mass, no electrical charge and a spin rotation value of one. They can travel far because they weigh nothing, but because they have energy, they also possess momentum. After this, Einstein 
pro proposed a photoelectric effect, where it is stated basically that photons that heat a material can be absorbed by it and excite its electrons to a higher energy state, but only if the photons possess the required amount of energy. If not, no matter how many photons heat the material, they would not be able to excite the electrons and be absorbed. In other words, it explains how light interacts with matter. Now, in quantum mechanics, we say that in a vacuum, photons move at a certain speed, the speed of light. Frequency times wavelength is the speed of light, in other words. Uh, the speed of these photons is about 2.9979245 times 10 to the 8 meters over second, which is an immensely high value. Actually, <laughs> it is the highest speed in the universe. So how did we manage to calculate it? Before anything related to particles, Maxwell calculated the speed of travel for the electromagnetic waves revealed by his mathematical formulas. He said speed was simply one over the square root of the electric permittivity in vacuum times the magnetic permeability in vacuum. When he assigned nine times 10 to the nine over four pi for the electric permittivity in vacuum and four pi times 10 to the minus seven for the magnetic permeability in vacuum, both of which uh, were known values at the time, by the way, his calculation yielded 2.998 times 10 to the eight meters over second, which exactly matches the value for the speed of light. Now, if we take into account what we mentioned before about photons mo forming a wave, then it makes sense, right? Before this, some experiments in order to derive the speed of, of light were also made by astronomers and scientists studying the light coming from planets and specifically the Galilean moons. But this wasn't accurate at all until Maxwell derived his. Nowadays, we can calculate a more accurate value by cavity resonance techniques and later by laser interferometer techniques. But how is this related to spectroscopy? Quinton will help us on that matter. Thank you, Matt. Maybe you've already heard that astronomers can use spectroscopy to determine what astronomical objects are made of. But how? What is spectroscopy, and what does it have to do with the chemical composition of objects? On a fundamental level, planets, stars, and galaxies are all made of atoms. Atoms can be visualized as consisting of a central nucleus, made of protons and neutrons, which is surrounded by electrons. One of the simplest models of the atom depicts it like so with the electrons traveling on orbit-like paths around the nucleus. Even though these electrons look like a solar system, it's important to remember that there are important differences between the paths electrons take in an atom and the paths that planets take around the sun. For one thing, an electron is only allowed to occupy certain orbits, known as energy levels. As the name implies, an electron will have a different amount of energy depending on which energy level it is in. Under normal circumstances, an electron will occupy the lowest energy orbital available to it, known as the ground state. But if the electron gains enough energy, it can temporarily jump up to a higher energy orbit before falling back down to the ground state after some time has passed. So what does any of this have to do with light? Well, Matt wouldn't have given you all a crash course on the properties of light if there weren't a connection to spectroscopy. The connection is that absorbing light is one of the primary ways that an electron may gain energy. As mentioned previously, the energy of a wave of light is related to its wavelength or its frequency, and if the energy of an incoming wave of light is equal to the difference between an electron's ground state and a higher energy level, the electron may absorb it and jump up to that higher state. When it falls back down to its ground state, it will emit a wave of light with the same energy as the one it absorbed. What this means is that each transition between two valid energy levels in a certain atom corresponds to its own unique wavelength of light. Light at this wavelength is absorbed in order to put the electron into the higher state, and light at this wavelength is emitted whenever an electron falls back down from this higher state. Every element on the periodic table has its own unique set of energy levels, which means that there is a unique set of wavelengths of light that each element will prefer to absorb and emit. This is called an emission spectrum or absorption spectrum. Pictured on the slide are some examples of emission spectra. The first image shows the emission spectrum for the element helium, and the second shows the emission spectrum for iron. Each one of the colored lines represents a wavelength of light that the element tends to emit during atomic transitions, which is known as a spectral line. 
The colors of these lines correspond to the color of light at each transition wavelength. Notice that only visible spectral lines are depicted in these images, and there are actually other wavelengths of light that these elements may absorb and emit. However, those wavelengths are outside of the range of human vision, so we can't assign a color to them. We've known for a long time that it's possible to split white light into its various component wavelengths using a prism. The light that passes through the prism is bent or refracted, but the precise amount of refraction that the ray experiences will depend on its wavelength. Since each color of light is refracted at a different angle, the end result is that the ray of light spreads out into a rainbow. It is also possible to split light into its spectrum using a device called a diffraction grating. Once you've managed to split light coming from an object into its component wavelengths, you can measure what those wavelengths are. The earliest spectroscopes would simply project the spectrum onto a surface that had been marked to show where certain wavelengths would show up. This would allow researchers to record the wavelengths of all the spectral lines. More modern spectrometers will project the spectrum onto a surface with a thin movable slit in it in front of a photodetector. The slit will only let a thin range of wavelengths through to the photodetector, depending on where in the spectrum the slit is located, and the photodetector can then precisely measure the intensity of light at that wavelength. Absorption of light is not the only way to cause an electron to transition to a higher energy level. You can also excite atoms by raising their temperature or by passing an electric current through them. No matter what causes the electrons to move to the higher energy state, whenever they are allowed to drop back down to the ground state on their own, they will emit light in certain wavelengths. If you excited a vial of, for example, neon gas, there would be spikes in the amount of light emitted at certain wavelengths corresponding to the spectral lines of neon. In fact, this is what is responsible for the distinctive red-orange color of neon signs. There is a high density of spectral lines in the red-orange section of neon's emission spectrum, so it tends to preferentially emit light of this color. But if you had a, a sample of some unknown mixture of gases, you could use the same method to identify them. If you excited the gas and measured the emission spectrum, you would get intensity peaks at the transition wavelengths of all the different gases in the mixture. So by cross-referencing the pattern you found with the emission spectra of known gases, you could determine which ones were present. You could even measure the proportion of gases in the mixture, because the more of a certain gas there is, the brighter its spectral lines will be. The absorption spectrum of a gas can also be used to identify it, since the wavelengths of light the gas will prefer to absorb will be the same wavelengths it will emit when excited. If you shone a bright light through a gas, and looked at the spectrum that emerged at the other side, you would notice gaps or dips in the intensity at certain wavelengths. These are the wavelengths the atom in the gas can absorb to cause electrons to move to higher states. But wait, wouldn't the atoms just re-emit the light they absorb after the electrons return to the ground state? Wouldn't that mean that the total intensity of light at that wavelength shouldn't change? Well, it is true that a wave of light at the excitation wavelength would be emitted when the electron is allowed to fall back down. The direction this wave will be traveling in will be random. So if you have a beam of light passing through the gas in a certain direction, the light at the transition wavelengths will be absorbed and very little of it will end up traveling in the same direction as the rest of the beam when it gets emitted again. This is what is responsible for the pattern of gaps that forms the absorption spectrum. But we've only talked about the spectra of individual atoms at this point in order to try to keep things simple. It's important to note that compounds like water and carbon dioxide also have their own spectra. And these spectra look different from the spectra of the elements that make them up. This happens because when atoms bond together to form molecules, the shapes of the paths the electrons can take within the molecule change. This results in a new set of energy levels and different excitation wavelengths that allow the electrons to access them. In many cases, the spectra of compounds are more important to scientists than the spectra of atoms, because with the exception of the noble gases, it is very rare to find individual atoms floating around by themselves. These spectra are especially important for astronomers, since many of the molecular spectra we have identified correspond to certain compounds that are necessary for life. So how exactly do astronomers use spectroscopy? I'll now hand the mic over to Amin so that he can let you know. Spectroscopy is very useful for astronomers. Because each chemical has its own signature spectral features, 
Measuring the spectra of light emitted from objects in the universe can tell us about the makeup and properties of those objects. The chemical composition, temperature, density, mass, distance, luminosity, and relative motion can be figured out for objects such as stars, planets, nebulae, galaxies, and active galactic nuclei. Usually in astronomy, spectroscopy is done in the visible spectrum, radio waves, or X-rays, because these specific bands of radiation are able to cross Earth's atmosphere. Space-based telescopes, however, do not have this limitation. There are three types of spectra that can be possibly detected. When light is radiated at all, the, at all wavelengths, a continuous spectrum is produced with no missing bands of color. An emission spectrum is black in most places, except for bands of emitted color. An absorption spectrum is the opposite. It has color everywhere, but there are bands of missing color. Ever since Isaac Newton used a prism to divide white light into a spectrum and started the result in the 17th century, astronomers have been investigating the spectrum of light from the sun and other celestial objects. In the 1850s, Gustav Kirchhoff discovered the different types of spectra mentioned in the last slide and what types of objects can emit which type of spectra. The chemical composition of the sun was discovered by comparing the absorption lines of the sun with the emission spectra of known gases. It was found that the sun was mainly made up of hydrogen and helium. Helium was discovered in this way and was named after the Greek titan of the sun, Helios. Later, helium was found to exist on Earth as well. This confirmed that astronomical bodies are made up of the same materials as what things on Earth are made up of, which was a major discovery at the time. Later on, this was applied for other celestial bodies such as stars, galaxies, the interstellar medium, planets, and also the expansion of the universe. We will go over all of these. Spectral lines can be used to identify which elements are present in stars. The temperature and density of those elements can also be found, as well as any magnetic field that is present. The width of spectral lines could tell us how fast the material is moving, which gives insight into winds that occur in stars. Stars emit absorption lines rather than emission lines. This means that the center of stars are producing a continuous spectrum at all wavelengths, but there's a lot of gas that the light passes through, which absorbs some wavelengths based on the type of element present in the gaseous layer. In binary star systems, where two stars orbit a shared center of mass, spectroscopy can tell us about the masses and radii of the two stars. The motions of stars can also be detected by shifts in spectral features, and we'll go over this soon. Different stars have different spectra. At first, it was thought that this was due to different composition. It turns out, however, that the difference was actually that of temperature. Higher temperatures can ionize elements like hydrogen, changing the spectra. Stars can actually be put into spectral classes. These are based on the temperature. They are O, B, A, F, G, K, and M, with O being the hottest and M being the coldest class. The spectroscopy has discovered that stars, which are large enough, begin to produce heavier and heavier elements through nuclear fusion ending in iron. Our sun, which is smaller, will only reach carbon and oxygen. Galaxies have similar spectra to stars, which makes sense because a galaxy is basically a large aggregate of stars. Analysis of spectral features found that galactic motions were much higher in velocity than expected, taking into account the mass of the stars alone. This led to the dark matter hypothesis. Dark matter makes up a great deal of the mass of galaxies and contributes to this velocity, but we cannot see it yet in any way. Galaxies are moving away from us, according to shifts in the spectra. This led us to believe that the universe is expanding. The next slide will be about this. The interstellar medium was also studied. This is the material between galaxies. 99% of it was found to be made up of common gases, such as hydrogen and helium, and trace amounts of gases like oxygen. The rest is metallic particles and ices. Nebulae can also be studied via their spectra, and were determined to be enormous masses of luminous gas or vapor. Spectroscopy can be used for planets as well. The reflected light of a planet contains absorption bands due to minerals on the surface and elements present in the atmosphere. We can study what these planets might look and feel like and determine if they're suitable for life. And more on that later. Uh, it was found that the universe is expanding. When we look at the spectra of faraway galaxies and the stars, we see shifts in the spectral features. From this, the distance to the star galaxy, the direction of movement, and the velocity can be determined. Distant galaxies see shifts toward being redder. This means that the wavelengths are increasing, which can only happen if the galaxies are moving away from us. In fact, the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away. Redshift can be explained in terms of water waves. If you're on a motorboat that is moving across a lake, you will create waves in the water. The waves in front of the boat will become bunched up, and the waves behind the boat will be spread out because of the velocity of the boat. 
The same thing happens for light wavelengths when a star or galaxy moves away from us. This is called the Doppler effect. From this effect, exoplanets can also be discovered. These are planets orbiting other stars, which cause shifts in the spectrum of that star, as well as the, as the gravity of the planet makes the star wobble back and forth. The Doppler effect is a very useful tool for multiple purposes. To conclude this presentation, we will discuss the search for life in the universe. When we find exoplanets, we can look for specific gases in the atmosphere using spectroscopy. Life can be inferred by the presence of signature gases, which can only be produced by living organisms. Exoplanet conditions can also be determined. There is a great variety of exoplanets. They come in different sizes, compositions, and distances from the star or stars. There is a habitable zone where life can exist at a certain range of distances from the planet's star. The detection of liquids such as water is important, as water or other similar liquids are thought to be crucial for life. To find out what we can expect from an exoplanet with life on it, we can study our own Earth to see what our spectrum will look like. Some elements that indicate life, such as, such as nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor, can be created by other processes as well, but elevated levels over normal can indicate the presence of life. Oxygen is a very reactive element and tends to get used up over time. So if there's a lot of oxygen, then perhaps life is creating more of it than can be used up, like on Earth. Methane is another such compound which life can create. Spectroscopy, as we can see, is key to our understanding of the distant universe and may one day be used to find the first case of life outside Earth. Well, everyone, you have been listening to the Aldani Castle Observatory's weekly teletube broadcast, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. The hosts this evening have been Quinton, Matt, Gagan, and myself, Amin. On the One Meter Telescope Live Imaging, we are telescope operators Anna and June. Make sure to leave any comments or questions in the comments section of the video below or talk to us in the chat right now. We will be around for the next 20 minutes to answer your questions. All of our programs are free, but if you would like to make a donation, please see our website at observatory.info.yorku.ca. We also have new observatory calendars and postcards available for sale through the York University Bookstore, which you can find on our website. You can always connect with us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at York Observatory and check out our website for show notes, content, updates, and contact info at observatory.info.yorku.ca. Thank you for tuning in. Clear skies and have a good night.